The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists, and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Bioethics, law, euthanasia, consumerism, politics, terrorism, globalization, religion, migrant population, interfaith, drug addiction. When Ethos first approached me to write a um, booklet about migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective, I was quite intrigued but also very apprehensive. So I was intrigued that they wanted to write this booklet but very apprehensive because first of all I'm not theologically trained, secondly I'm not especially religious, <laughs> thirdly um, I wasn't sure it was possible to determine what a Christian perspective is on anything when there are multiple perspectives and uh, various denominations. Um, Despite that, I took on the assignment and I changed the subtitle from a Christian perspective to Faith, Ethics and Social Justice because that was what the project eventually became for me, a means to explore an ethical framework um, that sort of was congruent with the key tenets of my faith but in relation to social justice, so that's kind of where I'm coming from tonight. Okay, so I can turn this on. Okay, so um, the booklet, this little thing here, uh, is divided into five sections. So in the actual booklet, I give a short introduction where I briefly define what I mean by power in politics, and then I outline the, the rest of the booklet. Uh, chapter one basically um, outlines the key characteristics of social justice as I understand it and apply it. I talk about what labor justice is or means for me and how the Christian faith um, principles are also congruent with international labour standards. Then that becomes the anchor for the rest of the booklet and then I talk about Singapore's work pass system which kind of contextualises the regime for migrant workers in Singapore and after kind of laying out what labour justice looks like, I dive into the empirical realities of migrant workers in which their lives are basically um, where, where they basically experience different manifestations of labour injustice and then I conclude with a reflection. So that's kind of the structure of today's talk. So just a brief introduction. Um, Singapore has the highest concentration of non-resident workers in Asia. Foreigners make up one third of our workforce. The total workforce as of December last year is about 1.3 million, of which about 70% are low wage work permit holders in the construction, marine, manufacturing, landscaping, service sectors and domestic work sectors. The two bigger, more visible populations would be construction workers and domestic workers. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a quote. Okay, it's by a PMD in 2010. I think we should make an important distinction between foreign workers and immigrants. Immigrants meaning PRs and citizens. Foreign workers are transient. We need them to work in the factories, banks, hospitals, shipyards. When the job is done, they will leave. When there are no jobs, they will go. Temporarily, the economy is hot. We can accept higher numbers. For the longer term, we are pushing to raise productivity so we can rely less on foreign workers. In the meanwhile, we want to build flats, MRT lines, IRLs. So please bear with the larger numbers for the time being. So I've very helpfully and not very subtly um, highlighted the keywords, right? So this community, low-paid migrant workers, are distinct, right? Distinct from those that are allowed to stay and those that should not settle here. So uh, distinction between, I guess, migrant workers in the low-paid sectors and what are sometimes referred to as quality talent. So they are disposable and denied agency. They come as we choose, they go as we please. We need to tolerate them as a kind of necessary for our benefit, but they are temporary, they are useful, but they will never be integrated fully. And this will help us to understand how foreign workers are framed and how our work permit system is designed. Okay, so social justice. So these are the, the headings in the booklet and the order in which I will go through them. Okay, social justice. Social justice very broadly refers to efforts to build a just and fair society. So social justice involves a negotiation of both joint and individual rights and obligations to enhance the capacities 
of marginalised persons and social groups, such that they have equal access to the resources, opportunities and rights that should be accorded to all, including the mechanisms for realising such rights. So it's not enough, for example, to print out brochures or organise workshops informing people what their rights are, if we do not also put in the resources to develop the structural conditions necessary for them to claim those rights in a meaningful way. So um, fairness is sometimes misunderstood to create, take, to create identical conditions for everyone. But Iris Marin Young, who is a political philosopher whose work has been very influential for me, she says social justice is not the melting away of differences. It's about creating institutions that promote the reproduction and respect of group differences without oppression. So social justice requires us to build fair institutions and institutional frameworks. It's about making the systems and structure of society more just, rather than seeking justice in individual cases. So it's also about process, not just outcomes. And sometimes when we raise problems, right, broader structural issues, the authorities may respond by saying, oh, okay, what's the worker's name? What's his fin number? Us ex worker to email Y officer in Z department and we will solve the individual person's problem. But that's not we, what we are asking for. We are asking for the structural conditions to change, not to solve just one person's problem based on the discretionary power of a particular officer. So social justice demands that we are attentive towards and demonstrate solidarity with the disabled and excluded. We need to acknowledge unequal power relations this is especially vital when it comes to low-paid migrant workers, but not only. Imbalance of power is a vital contextual feature that underpins the employment realities in Singapore. It influences decision-making. It influences the chances for fair outcomes when we seek remedial justice. Okay, so what does the Bible say? So I have been advised I should not use words I cannot pronounce. But <laughs> I had no way of not using these two words because I use them in the booklet. But anyway, I don't speak Hebrew. I checked on the internet and apparently it is Mishpat and Sedekah. Okay? So I could either pronounce it or use the pointer to just point at it when I wanna when I wanna use that word. So okay. So apparently Mishpat means justice in Hebrew and it apparently appears in the Old Testament like two hundred times. It emphasizes action and it means to treat people equitably. The justice of society is assessed by the way we treat groups with no social power. Neglecting these social groups indicates not just a lack of mercy or charity, but it's a violation of justice. Oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce. This is from Timothy Keller, who wrote a book called Generous Justice. So Keller says, God loves and defends those with the least economic and social power, and so should we. He talks about scandalous justice. I love this term, right? So the Bible shows a God that stood on the side of the poor and the powerless rather than the elites in society. So he says this is a scandalous position then, and I would say that it's also a scandalous position now. So what do actual Bible verses say? They say, do not give preferential treatment or special attention to the rich and discriminate against the poor. Do not profiteer from exploiting others. Do not exploit and abuse the vulnerable, Pay just wages on time. Living in luxury while withholding wages is, an, is a reprehensible act for which you will be judged. Gross inequality in payment is ungodly. It is immoral to exploit others for monetary gain and do not hoard wealth at the expense of others' well-being. Practice generosity. Landowners, business owners should ensure a measure of their profits, profits are distributed to immigrants and the poor. Ensure access and opportunities are granted to the weakest so that gross inequalities and unhealthy dependencies will not persist. Speak out for and help the poor and oppressed. So Daniel Rudy, who is a theology professor, talks about Christian, 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 Christian spirituality being one that involves living out what Jesus most valued. And Jesus showed a preferential option for the poor and oppressed. With specific regard to foreigners, the commandments are clear. Do not oppress, do not discriminate, do not pervert justice, consider their needs and love them as yourself. And as some others have pointed out, Jesus himself was an outsider, a refugee, treated with hostility. So Gudi, uh, who spells it differently, uh, said a car, whatever. <laughs> so he talks about um, how it, it refers to various dimensions of life and it's about social righteousness as opposed to self-righteousness, which is a very different thing. So social righteousness is expressed in relational interdependence and a profound attentiveness to the needs of others. 
No peace is possible without justice. No justice is possible without right relationships. Justice is about fidelity to the demands of relationships. It deals with how individuals, families, communities, as well as judicial, religious and political authorities interact with each other, with the most vulnerable members of society and with the covenant of God. So now we're back to Keller. And he also says that Siddhartha means a life of right relationships. Biblical righteousness is social. Rather than invoking private morality, it refers to our day-to-day -day living, how we conduct our relationships in our family and our society with fairness, generosity and equity. When the two words are paired together, social justice emerges. Ultimately, doing justice includes not only the righting of wrongs, but generosity and social concern towards the poor and vulnerable. It consists of a broad range of activities, from simple fair and honest dealings with people in daily life, to regular, radically generous giving of your time and resources, to activism that seeks to end particular forms of injustice, violence and oppression. So Keller also promotes what he calls a whole cloth biblical agenda, and he points out how in certain churches and communities, some ethical prescriptions are emphasised to the near exclusion of others. So for example, maybe some churches may emphasise private morality, but not talk about social justice or vice versa, or he, talk, he warns of religious leaders not to omit particular sins. So for example, harping on the moral failings of the working class, but not talking about the moral failings of the management classes, for example, economic oppression or greed. So to do justice requires us to live in a way that generates a strong community where human beings can flourish. Sometimes it may be necessary for the strong and powerful to disadvantage themselves for the weak, for the majority to make sacrifices for the minority. Religious leaders at the state are also called to not unduly favour the rich and the influential or to neglect the poor. So charity versus justice. Okay, so I wanted to raise this tension because I think it's especially relevant in the Singapore context. So there are a lot of Christian groups, whether in churches or in schools, that are very uh, immersed in works of charity and it's really heartwarming. At the same time, there's this um, reticence to get involved in work that seems to cross some boundary that is seen as political. Um, and I think that part of it is also because we create this false binary between charity and justice. So the ANAJ identifies a stumbling block to church's involvement in economic justice and it is this dichotomy between charity and justice. It's a false dichotomy, they say, because justice is a necessary expression of charity and a just system makes charity more possible. Um, they also talk about an evolution of programs, so how church groups may start by uh, dealing with uh, symptoms like hunger, but as they get to know the community, they might realise what some of the structural causes are and then they evolve their programmes to deal with those root causes. So they talk about a continuum of action. So Carmen Guerrero says, it is not a matter of either or. I believe both must take place, but not one at the expense of the other. While we are called to feed the hungry, we are equally called to address the cause of that hunger. Our goal is to know the difference and to be prepared to work in both areas for the glory and honour of God. So a theologian, Stephen Mott, says charity, an expression of love, is closely intertwined with justice, which he sees as an instrument of love. We require justice as well as love to carry on what love starts, but cannot finish alone, which I thought was a really nice way of putting it. The reality of sin, meanwhile, means that individuals cannot be left to act on the impulses of love. Justice is not a different principle. It's Rather, it expresses in terms of fixed duty and obligation the appropriate response to love in certain social situations. So this brings to mind Pope Benedict's encyclical where he highlights that our economic sphere is neither ethically neutral or inherently inhuman or opposed to society. Rather, because it is part and parcel of human activity, precisely because it is human, it must be structured and governed in an ethical manner. Okay, so Martin Luther King, he explained why justice must be social, not individual. He says we are bound in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects directly, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So in his 1963 speech, he addresses this half-truth that legislation has a limited role to play in social change movements, that you have got to change the heart and you can't change the heart through legislation. 
So King acknowledges that religion and education play key roles in changing hearts. However, he also says, we must go on to say that while it may be true morality cannot be legislated, behaviour can be regulated. It may be true the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me, and I think that is pretty important also. Okay, so labour justice. So labour justice, of course, refers to adherence and compliance with labour laws and labour standards. But for me, it's more than just compliance with labour laws, right? Labour justice represents a principal orientation with which we assess labour relations. And a genuine democratisation of institutions is crucial to achieving social justice, of which I see labour justice as an integral part. It's an ethical framework. It gives life to an aspirational vision of achieving safe, healthy, fulfilling workplaces governed by egalitarian workplace relations. So this is broadly encapsulated in the International Labour Organization's Decent Work for All agenda, which talks about productive work, a fair income, security in the workplace, social protection, personal development, freedom of expression, freedom of organisation, and participating in decision-making and equality. So I somehow managed to delete something from my slides, but um, the ILO also has two handbooks um, that talk about, okay, where's the handbook? Oh, okay, so um, the Decent Work for All agenda is also strongly supported by key religious and spiritual traditions. So the ILO has two handbooks. One is called The Philosophical and Spiritual Perspectives on Decent Work, and another one is called Convergences, Decent Work and Social Justice in Religious Tradition. So if you're interested, you can also look up those two books, booklets. So Catholic social teaching, as cited in the ILO handbook, says, if the organisation of economic life is such that the human dignity of workers is compromised or their freedom of action is removed, the church does not hesitate to judge such an economic order to be unjust, even if it produces a vast amount of goods. Dignity, human dignity, is a foundational belief in Christian teachings. It's a core value underlying the decent work agenda. It's a, and a key principle underlying this paradigm is that labour is not dignity. This moral assertion mitigates against dehumanising perspectives in which persons are assessed very narrowly in terms of their economic utility, as if they were an inanimate product that can be negotiated for the highest profit or the lowest price. And I guess the most extreme manifestation of this would be slavery. International labour standards. Okay, so what does the church say about international labour standards? So in 1965, Catholic bishops identified that among the basic rights of the human person must be the right of freely founding labour unions, independent unions, not state-controlled unions. An attendant right is that of taking part freely in the activity of these unions without fear of reprisal. The economy must serve the people, not the other way around. If the dignity of work is to be protected, the basic rights of workers must be respected. The right to productive work, to decent and fair wages, to the organising and joining of unions, etc. Civil authorities, meanwhile, must enact just laws. Laws that correspond to the dignity of the human person and what is required by right reason. Establishing and maintaining social justice is largely reliant on the fairness and strength of its legal system. Discrimination and decent working conditions. So Ilo Hamburg points out that equal treatment of natives and foreigners is repeated, is absolute and repeated over and over again in the Bible. They also talk about rest days, fair wages, safe working, safe working environments and social security. Catholic social doctrine says a just wage is a legitimate fruit of work. To re refuse or withhold it is a grave injustice. And payment for work should guarantee a dignified livelihood for the worker and his or her family on material, social, cultural, spiritual levels. So it's not talking about squeezing out some bare bones wage that allows a person to subsist. It's more than that. Social protection and safety at work, the right to life, to physical and spiritual integrity, to provide essentials for a reasonable quality of life. Food, clothing, rest, shelter, medical care, and necessary social services and security through various life stages. So this includes when someone is not able to work, when they're old, when they're unemployed, when they're sick. So the state, meanwhile, may not be expected to solve all social problems, but they should avoid removing from smaller communities those functions that are properly theirs. They should also stop intervening to the detriment of economic and civil freedoms. Okay, so 
that was basically the outline, the anchor, the framework, social justice, labour justice, right? So that is the lens that I use to assess our work pass system and the situation for migrant workers in Singapore. And um, I'm going to drink some water while I leave you to read my first quotable quote. The foreign workforce is interesting. Okay, this is by uh, DPM Teo Chi here. They act to the workforce, but they don't grow and re old and retire here. They are here when they're active and don't contribute to our aging population. There's an advantage to having a transient workforce here which helps us to contribute to the economy and does not impose a social load on us when they grow old and don't demand, demand a social load from us when they are very young. Quotable quote two. When we look at the migrant workers issue, <clears throat> we are not looking at it from the perspective of human rights. We are looking at it on a needs basis. Like it or not, we need to sustain and grow an economy able to generate an annual GDP of $35,000. That seems like a wrong figure, but anyway. At the end of the day, whatever factors would be able to help us sustain the growth of the economy for the benefit of the country, we will go for it. Okay, so that's Yoga Kwang, Chairman of NTUC's Migrant Workers Centre. Okay, so our forefathers were migrants too. So, <clears throat> before I go back and comment on those quotes, um, there is this tendency, I think, for us to evoke our immigrant history. And I can relate to that tendency. Sometimes when we speak or hear of migrant workers who are exploited, then someone would say, oh, you know, our great-grandparents were migrants too, so we need to understand what it's like to be separated from your family, to want to move overseas and strive, achieve socio-economic mobility. And I think it can be a very powerful way of trying to um, increase empathy for migrant workers. At the same time, what incites a more cynical response from me is when policymakers also try to evoke this immigrant history, when it is very clear that the labour migration regime of the past and now is very, very different. So our great-grandparents, for example, they could be carpenters or coolies, some see women, but they come here, they can get married to whoever they choose. I mean, barring social practices at the time. And they could settle down, have children, grandchildren, and achieve some level of socioeconomic mobility. This is not possible for a Bangladeshi or Indian migrant worker on a work permit today. So we have a tiered work pass system in Singapore. And I'm going to focus on the main three and mostly on work permits. So. <clears throat> If you, want it, uh, if you come here on an employment pass, you must be a professional who earns at least $3,600. As passes are for mid-skilled um, empl foreign employees who earn at least $2,200 a month. It is a pass that sometimes gets abused, but I won't have time to go into that now. So, work permits. Low-wage work permit holders come on a work permit system that is very similar to what is known as the kafala system in the Gulf states or guest worker systems in the US and Canada. So it's an employer-sponsored system and an employer-controlled work pass. So an employer decides when you can come, and the employer has the unilateral right to fire you and send you back whenever they want. There are restrictions on family reunification. So unlike employment pass holders who earn a certain salary and can bring family members, work permit holders are not allowed to. They cannot apply for PR and citizenship and they are not allowed to marry Singaporeans without permission from the government. So MOM has said, as transient workers, they ought to come to Singapore for work purposes only. This work permit condition serves to discourage and prevent a large pool of unskilled or lower-skilled migrant workers from settling here through marriages with Singaporeans.